All right, so let's get into this. We got some interesting materials to go through today. All about stable angina treatment options. Yeah, looks like someone's weighing some pretty big decisions. Exactly. <laughs> And they're trusting us to help them figure it all out, which we're totally going to do. <laughs> Absolutely. And we'll focus on, you know, breaking down the benefits and the risks of each option yeah. using those materials you've provided. Perfect. So you're already familiar with stable angina. But what's interesting here is this source focuses on people whose medication isn't totally cutting it. Like it's not fully controlling their angina. Yeah, it's like, okay, medication's helping a little, but now what? Right, what's next? Yeah. So what are we looking at? Seems like the big three are optimizing medication further, Okay. angioplasty, uh -huh. and then CABG surgery. Big stuff. Yeah, big stuff. Each path has like, you know, its own pros and cons. Right, of course. Makes sense. So even if we're considering other interventions, the source really highlights that medication is still super important. It's like the foundation. Yeah. It is. And they list all these different types. GTN, yeah. beta blockers, yeah, well. calcium channel blockers, mm -hmm. even statins, aspirin, clopidogrel. Whoa. That's a mouthful. It is. How do people keep track of all this? Well, I think it helps to think about what each medication actually does, right? right? So some are for like right now relief and some are to prevent problems later on. Makes sense. Like an orchestra. Each instrument has its own part to play. Okay, I like that. So you know you got GTN that's like your soloist. It comes in strong when you need it most to relieve that angina attack right when it's happening. When you need it. Yeah. Then you have those beta blockers, they're like the rhythm section, you know, just, just keeping that steady beat behind the scenes to help prevent future attacks. I like that. So it's not just about treating the symptoms in the moment, it's also about preventing future problems. Exactly. And then you got the long game. You got those statins working hard to lower your risk of heart attack and stroke way down the line. Okay, so it's multi-pronged approach. I like that. It is. It is. But what I'm really curious about is how these other procedures work like angioplasty and ah. CABG. Can we dive into that? Yeah, let's get visual. So angioplasty, imagine a teeny tiny balloon okay. inflating inside your narrowed artery. Oh, wow. So they have this catheter right. with a balloon at the tip. They thread it through an artery, usually in your wrist or sometimes your groin. And when they reach that blockage, they inflate the balloon. It pushes the plaque outward, widens that artery. Okay, but wait, what keeps the artery open after they deflate the balloon? Uh, good question. That's where the stent comes in. It's like this little metal scaffold they insert. Oh, I see. To prop the artery open and keep that blood flowing. Pretty neat, huh? That's pretty awesome. It is. Okay, so what about CABG? Yeah. Because that sounds way more intense. It is more invasive. So basically, they take a healthy blood vessel from somewhere else in your body, your leg or chest. Yeah. And they use it to make a bypass. Oh. Around the blocked part of your heart artery. So it's like creating a detour. A detour for your blood. I see. So both of those options are aiming to improve blood flow, but they just take different approaches. But is the long-term impact the same? Well, that's where the benefits and risks start to really come into play. Like, take angioplasty, for example. Great at reducing angina attacks. Right. But the source material says it's not actually thought to reduce the risk of death from heart disease in stable angina cases. Hmm. That's a pretty big consideration. Yeah. What about CABG? Does that change the risk? It's a little more complicated. CABG may reduce the risk of death from heart disease, but it depends a lot on individual circumstances. So we can't say for sure. Right. And the other important thing to remember is that neither procedure is like a magic cure right. for coronary artery disease. So even if you have one of these procedures, you're probably still going to need medication. Still have to make lifestyle changes. It's a tool in the toolbox, not a get out of jail free card. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah. And speaking of tools, the source actually gave us some pretty eye catching statistics about how well each procedure relieves angina attacks. Oh, let's hear it. Let's hear the numbers. So after one year, about 52 out of every 100 people who had angioplasty and kept taking their meds were free from angina attacks. Yeah, 52 out of 100. For CABG, it was a bit higher at 59 out of 100. So initially, CABG has a slight edge. But what about long term? Do those numbers change? They do. It gets interesting. After five years or more, the gap kind of shrinks. About 33 out of 100 people were angina free after angioplasty, compared to 38 out of 100 after CABG. Not such a big difference, right? So it's like with angioplasty, you get a quicker improvement, but maybe CABG has more staying power. But I'm guessing there's more to consider than just 
symptom relief. Oh, for sure. Lots of other factors to think about. Like what? Recovery time, uh-huh. potential complications. Right. And that's where understanding the risks associated with each option gets really important. Definitely. And our source material goes there. Like straight into talking about, you know, the risk of dying during or shortly after the procedure. Okay, whoa. Getting real serious here. So what are the chances? So for angioplasty, it's on average less than one in a hundred people. Okay. Which means that over 99 out of 100 people don't die in the hospital after angioplasty. And for CFG, it's a similar story. Less than 1 in 100 people die in the hospital after the surgery. Okay, so the risk is definitely there, but statistically it seems pretty low. Yeah. I imagine there are other things that could go wrong, though, besides, you know, the worst case scenario. Of course. And the source talks about those, too. Okay, good. So with angioplasty, because it's less invasive, complications are generally less common. Right. You might have some bruising or bleeding where they put in the catheter. Right. In really rare cases, there could be heavier bleeding, and there's a small chance of an allergic reaction to the dye they use. Got it. What about CABG? Since it's more involved, I imagine the risks are higher. Yeah. You're looking at things like pain at the surgery site, potential for heavier bleeding, yeah. chance of infection and a risk of developing an irregular heartbeat. Okay. But again, these are just possibilities. Your actual risk will depend on your overall health and other factors specific to you. Right, it's all very individualized. What about long-term risks? Like, what are the chances of needing another procedure down the road? Ah, yes, the repeat performance question. The source actually points out a really interesting difference between angioplasty and CABG here. Okay, what is it? It looks like people who have angioplasty tend to need further procedures more often than folks who have CABG. So it's like CABG, even though it's a bigger deal up front, might give you more peace of mind long term. Potentially, yeah. But it's important to remember these are just trends. Right. Individual results can vary a lot. Like with any medical procedure, no guarantees. Right, of course. Okay, so we've talked about symptom relief. We've covered risks both short term and long term. I feel like we're building a good foundation for making an informed choice. I think so too. But there's another crucial layer to think about. Okay. You. Yeah. You know your personal circumstances, your preferences. All of that plays a big role in deciding what's right for you. Exactly. Because we could talk about all these statistics and medical terms, but at the end of the day, it's about finding a solution that fits your life, your mm-hmm. priorities. You know your comfort level. 100%. And that's where the source material takes a really cool turn. Okay. It shifts from like, you know, objective data to these more subjective personal factors. You trace. It's like it's saying, okay, here's the info. Now let's talk about you. I like that. Okay, let's talk about those personal decision-making factors. All right. So the source starts off with this really powerful question. How much is angina impacting your daily life? Yeah. You know, is it just a minor inconvenience? Or is it preventing you from doing the things you love? I can see how the severity of your symptoms would really affect how you want to approach treatment. For sure. If angina is constantly holding you back, you might be more willing to try something more aggressive, even if it comes with higher risks. And then the source asks, how do you feel about the risks associated with each procedure? That's a big one. Some people are comfortable with risk and others aren't. Exactly. It's okay to have different comfort levels. The key is being honest with yourself and your doctor. Totally. And then there's the practical stuff, right? Like recovery time. Oh yeah, the recovery question. So the source wants us to think about how much recovery time we can handle realistically. You know, if you have a busy job or family commitments, a long recovery might not be doable. Right. It's like planning a trip. You have to think about travel time and make sure it fits your schedule. Totally. And finally, the source throws in one more practical thing. Support. Oh, right. Do you have people to help out at home after the procedure? That's huge. Having a supportive network to help with meals and stuff can make such a difference in recovery. It's like having your own personal cheer squad. Love it. Okay, so those are some general factors, Mm -hmm. but does the source give any advice on choosing between angioplasty and CABG specifically? It does. It boils it down to three key points that can help you decide. Okay, break it down for us. Mm -hmm. What's the first point of comparison? The source asks, how important is a quick recovery to you? If you want to get back on your feet, ASCP angioplasty with its shorter recovery time might be the way to go. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's like choosing a quick repair versus a major overhaul. Sometimes you need to get back in the game quickly, but what if you are okay with more downtime for potentially better results? 
then CABG might be worth considering. It's a bigger commitment up front, but it could offer longer term benefits, like a lower chance of needing another procedure. And that brings us to the second point. Okay. Would you rather avoid future treatments if possible? That's the million dollar question. Right. No one can predict the future. But from what we've seen in the source material, CIBG might be a safer bet in terms of how long it lasts. What else is there? Yeah, what else? Scarring. Ah, the cosmetic consideration. Exactly. So because CIBG is a more invasive surgery, it will leave a bigger scar on your chest and wherever they take the graft from. Angioplasty, on the other hand, just leaves tiny scars. So if minimizing scarring is a priority, angioplasty might be better. It all comes down to what matters most to you. Okay, so we've covered so much. From the details of each procedure to the very personal side of making this decision, what's the main takeaway? That there's no one right answer for everyone. The best choice is what aligns with your individual needs and values and circumstances. Couldn't have said it better myself. And remember, you don't have to do this alone. You have a healthcare team that can give you personalized advice. Absolutely. Rely on their expertise, ask all the questions you have, and trust your gut. Okay, so we've reached the end of our deep dive, but before we wrap things up, we want to leave you with one final thought-provoking question. Think about what part of recovery worries you the most. Yeah, like, is it the time it takes to get back to normal, the thought of being uncomfortable, how it might mess with your routine? Or is it something totally different? Because the way you answer that could really help you figure out which option feels better for you, angioplasty or CABG. Exactly. And there's no right or wrong answer here. Nope. It's all about finding what brings you the most peace of mind. What lets you live your life the way you want. And as you talk with your doctor and keep learning about your options, there's one thing we really want you to remember. This decision, it's yours. You get to choose. You have the power to make a choice that feels right for you. Trust your gut. Do your research, and don't be afraid to speak up for what you need. I hope this deep dive is giving you the knowledge and the confidence to make this decision. Yeah, we covered a lot today. If anything we talked about sparked any questions or you want to go back over something, please reach out. We're here for you. We're here to support you every step of the way. Thanks for joining us on The Deep Dive.